on July the 10th of this year, at about 5.30 a.m. on a Sunday morning, Pastor Jim took a selfie with his daughter. So Pastor Jim can actually do some of those cool things that kids do. That probably would accumulate in the number of selfies in my life, maybe up to four or five total. Um, But this one is probably one of my favorites. At six o'clock that morning, Brianna and I were part of 2,931 other men and women who took off running the Missoula Half Marathon. And you see from the starting line, actually about halfway through the starting line, and if you're familiar with Missoula, that is out on McClay Flats over on the southwest part of town. And we would end up running through that area and into town and ultimately downtown. But uh, it was quite an amazing thing to see all of those bodies and to be in the midst of all of those bodies. I will tell you that in the middle of that, there isn't many options on how you run. Uh, You can't go any faster than the person in front of you, and you can't go any slower than the person behind you. And if you want to do anything to either side, uh, you have to wait for an opportune moment. Now, by the way, out of those... 2,931 people who were running, how do you think that broke down as far as men and women? What would be your guess? 50-50? Who do you think had more represented there? Why would you think such a thing? I was astounded at the actual numbers. Over 2,100 of them were women. A little over 800 of them were men. I felt overwhelmed and outnumbered. And my question to the male species of humanity is where in the world are we? We need reinforcements. Nobody heard John Dahl just say that he's been beat down. (laughs) Because John Dahl would never get in that kind of trouble. Sandy still has her head down. I can see the wheels spinning. I've been out to John's house. He has a nice shed outside. I think he can sleep in for a couple of days at least, so. But anyway, that's just kind of an interesting statistic that was there. And by the way, when I'm out running around in the morning as I do, um, it is interesting that there very seldom do I ever, ever see another male species out on, on the streets in the morning running. Evidently, we must be healthier or something and don't need to do it. Um, but probably not. But when I run, and I pretty much do five days a week, there is something that I don't say this in any way, shape, or form. a matter of fact, none of this sermon today is, is in any way intended to point in the direction of me. Um, truth be known, I was out of those 2,900 somewhere in the 800s where I finished. So this is nothing spectacular that you're going to hear today of Pastor Jim being super marathon man because he wasn't. Uh, Pastor Jim was just happy to cross the finish line and still be alive the next day. And and that's the equivalent of it. Um, But when I run in the mornings, it is a time where I spend time with God. I don't have the cool earbuds that people run with, with all of their music and so forth. It takes me a couple of blocks for my mind to wake up in the morning and clear And then I legitimately and honestly believe that the God that I serve in heaven begins to speak to my heart. Um, It is where I spend a whole lot of time thinking and receiving what I preach on Sabbaths. It is where most days I pray for my family. 
and it is just something that happens when I run. Now, in the beginning of this day, that didn't happen very quickly um, because the minute I took my mind off of what I was doing, it was like I was afraid I was going to be tripping up and causing a domino effect because the people literally were lined up as you see them for a good mile into the race. It was just a wall of people, and it kind of just started to spread out from there. But as it did, and I just began to let my thoughts wander, I began to think about in Scripture all of the places that the Bible talks about this thing that we are in life, creatures created by God. Basically, we are running a race. And there at the end of the race is a destination. It is a prize, as Paul talks about, as we mentioned in the children's story. And I began kind of going through those different verses. And before I had gone too long, I knew that at some point, this would be what we are doing here today. It would be a sermon. And the verse that we went to, or that I went to that morning, I'm going to have you turn with me to in your Bibles here, the book of Hebrews chapter 12, and the first couple of verses. Hebrews chapter 12, and verses 1. 1 and 2. This is one of those verses that kept coming into my mind, and, and the neat thing, at least for me, it may not be so neat for you, you can determine that at some point, but for me it was neat because I was thinking about some of the things that were actually happening as I was going through that experience and how they lined up with things that we're going to read here in this verse, and so we're going to show you a few of those today. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, page 1193 in your pew Bible there, and the first couple of verses. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, I want to just stop and focus on those words for just a moment. Therefore, since we are surrounded. Those words are telling us that this is the reason and the motivation that we do what follows in these two verses. Because we are surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, it says, we are to throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And I love that part going back to our children's story, kids, just very briefly. He did this for the what? The joy that was set before him. The race that Jesus ran ended where? It ended at the cross. And he did that for the joy. You know who the joy is? It's you. And it's me. We are the joy and the reason that Jesus ran the race, that he endured the cross. And today he sits at the right hand of God, ministering on our behalf, helping us to run the what? The race. Because more than anything else, Jesus wants us to get the prize. He wants us to run in such a way to get the prize. And Hebrews tells us how to do that. Now, as we were sitting there and waiting for the race to begin, I figured out rather quickly that I wasn't a very seasoned race runner because there were literally hundreds of people in the early morning hours when it was cool, that were dressed like this. And if you can see that, it's a little hard to see with the lighting in here. But if you can't tell, they are wearing what? They're wearing trash bags. I would have never guessed that the cool thing to do before you start a half marathon is to wear trash bags. But there were scores and scores of people who were wearing black trash bags. Now, I opted for the less cool thing. I just had a sweatshirt on, and I thought that was okay, but these guys all had that on, not to mention 
Then there were these people that were running around, and what they have on is, you know, that Tyvek stuff that you see on houses before they put the siding on? They had these things wrapped around them. Who would have thought that you should have plastic bags or house siding to wrap yourselves in before you would start on a race? Now, I don't think they had that actually stapled to themselves, but they were covered in the siding, and I'm assuming that somehow the plastic or the Tyvek stuff that that's made out of does something to keep you warm. My sweatshirt seemed to keep me warm, but maybe that does something in warming you up that helps you run better. I don't know. But the one thing that I did know as I observed this is I was thinking, surely these folks are going to take these things off before they start what? Before they start running, because this doesn't look like anything that I would want to run a race in. And sure enough, when the race started, it was an amazing thing. It was time to go line up. And you will see this in the rest of the race as well when you come to get water cups and so forth. Runners don't have to worry about neatness or tidiness, okay? When somebody hands you a cup of water when you're running by, you ever watch this on the marathons and think, wow, that'd be cool to do. Just drink your water and just throw your glass wherever it goes and not worry about it. Well, that's what you do. The road's just covered with paper cups for people. But at the start of the race, all these people just rip off their plastic bags and they leave them on the ground and they go off running. And I figured out, you know what? They didn't have to worry about putting their sweatshirt somewhere and going and getting it or something. They just took their inexpensive little plastic bag and threw it off and never worried about it again. But they had to do something before they began running, didn't they? They had to throw off something that would hinder them as they were running. Because you certainly wouldn't want to try running like that, would you? And Hebrews says, since we are surrounded by such a cloud of witnesses, it says we are to throw aside everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily what? Entangles us. God wants us to run this race in a way that we are not caught up with certain things. And I want to go to Adam Clark's commentary on the New Testament here and, and look at what is being told to us here in Hebrews. As those who ran in the Olympic races would throw aside everything that might impede them in their course, so Christians professing to go to heaven must throw aside everything that might hinder them in their Christian race. Whatever weighs down our hearts or affections to earth is to be carefully avoided for no man with the love of the world in his heart can ever reach the kingdom of heaven. Now those are pretty important words, aren't they? If we want to finish the race, we must be willing to throw aside what? Everything that is going to hinder us from reaching the kingdom of heaven. In your Bibles, turn with me over to 1 John chapter 2, and we want to look at verses 15 through 17. And we're just going to be in an area of books in the Bible here from basically Corinthians to 1 John, so a small little area of our Bibles today, easy to keep track of. 1 John chapter 2 and verses 15 through 17. And that's page 1208 in your pew Bible there. 1 John 2, verses 15 through 17. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, the boasting of what he has and does comes not from the Father, but from where? From the world. The world and its desires are going to what? Pass away. But the man who does the will of God will do what? Will live forever. What is John telling us about this race that we are in? Is it easy sometimes to be weighed down with the things of the world? It's easy to think about that sometimes in the trials and the difficulties we face in the world. Those things weigh us down. But I think John here is looking at this in a little different way that the affections of our heart, rather than being towards God, the affections of our heart goes towards the what? 
the world. And when my affections in my heart are more for the things of the world than they are for Jesus, am I going to be able to run the race in such a way as to get to the prize? It's going to make it hard to do, isn't it? And I can't answer the question for any of you here today, but the question I would have for myself, the question I would have you ask yourself, is in this race that you are running, knowing what the prize is and knowing what God has asked of you, how much of the world today, how much of the things of the world or the ways of the world are weighing you down and hindering you from running the race that God would have you to run. Stop and let that circulate in your mind for a while. And think about what John is saying here. If we hang on to the things of the world, we will never, ever reach where? We will never reach the finish line. And John isn't saying here that it is by our works or by the way we run the race that we're going to get the prize because it's only through Christ Jesus that we get the prize. But understand, we can't experience what Christ is really wanting to do in our hearts and in our lives unless we make room for who to be there, for Jesus to be there. And if we want to run the race in the way Jesus has called us to, in the way in which we can receive the prize, we must be willing to throw aside what? All that hinders us. And the sin that so easily entangles us. The second thing that we talk about here is that we run the race with perseverance, the course that is marked out for us. We're going to come back to perseverance and start with the course. Um, before we ran the race, we were all given a map far ahead of the day that told you exactly where you would be running. Now, as long as I had lived in Missoula, I looked at that map and realized, you know what, I could make it until we get into town, and then I have no idea what we're going to be doing when we're going all around. And so there is reason to be prepared and know the course that is set out in front of you. And you kind of worry about how that's going to work out, but as you went, you found out that along the course... There were guys like this or ladies like this, mainly ladies probably because of the numbers, right? And they were carrying balloons with them. Now, those balloons served a couple of purposes. A, they had a number written on them, and that number represented the fastness in which you could run a mile. In other words, if it had an eight on the balloon, you could run an eight-minute mile. And so that was kind of a way of pacing yourself so you didn't go too fast or too slow running in such a way as to get the prize, right? And if you are used to running an eight-minute mile, then you kind of want to hang around the balloon that has an eight. And the guy carrying that had a watch, and it told him exactly what he was doing, probably wearing one just cool like I am. And, uh, and away they go. And so you had that. And then the course was marked out with big orange cones and painted things on the roads where you had to make turns. There was absolutely no way, unless you really wanted to, that you could get lost in running this race. There's no way you could get off the course. And according to what we read in Hebrews, it tells us that God has marked out a course for us to run. Did you know the path that leads from where you are today to where God ultimately wants you in his kingdom has already been laid out. Jesus talks about it in John chapter 14. He says, I am the what? Jesus is the way. The course is marked out in front of you. In your Bibles, go back to 1 Corinthians 9 where we were for our children's story today. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and we want to just look at verse 26 this time. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 26, page 1134, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and verse 26. And notice what Paul says there in this race, running in such a way to get the prize. He says, therefore, I do not run like a man running what? Aimlessly. 
I don't run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. In other words, Paul is running with a what? He's running with a purpose. He's running knowing the course that has been laid out in front of him. How do we know the course that has been laid out in front of us? Has Jesus given us a road map ahead of time? He has, hasn't he? And has Jesus run the course ahead of us so he knows where it goes? And he goes before us, doesn't he? Matter of fact, there's a neat promise in Isaiah that says not only when we turn our hearts to God will he run before us, but he said he also runs where? Behind us. God is there with us and he will show us the way, won't he? We don't have to run aimlessly if we have our road map, if we have Jesus. He's the one that is basically running ahead of us with the balloons. And you know what? He knows at just what pace all of us can go, doesn't he? Do we all go the same pace in this race? Does God lead us all in the exact same way? Oh, it's a far different thing for all of us sometimes, isn't it? But isn't it reassuring to know that no matter where we are, God knows where we are? And isn't it assuring to know that no matter where we are, because God knows where we are, we can know where we are, and we can know the way to where he would have us to go. But there's another reason that he says, run the course laid out for you. Have you ever been disobedient to God before in the course that he has laid out before you? Have you ever thought you knew a better way? Or maybe just wanted to go a better way for whatever reason? Look with me over here to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5. Second Timothy chapter 2, page 1178. Second Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5. And Paul is going through a series of things here, but in verse 5 he randomly goes back to this theme that Paul comes back to over and over again in Scripture. Paul must have liked things like the Olympics and races because he's constantly interjecting that theme into his writings here, not talking about it in general, but all of a sudden here in verse 5, he says, similarly, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he does what? Unless he competes according to the rules. Now, there was an interesting thing that happened in this race they gave you a number that you would wear. My number was 5274. I tried to figure out what is the significance of why they gave me that number. And after the race, or about halfway through, I figured it out, actually. 52 is how old I am. 74 is how old I felt after about the first two or three miles. <laughs> so that was my number. I don't know if it worked for everybody, but it did for me. But on the back of my number was this little piece of plastic glued to the back of this little vinyl number thing I had. And that piece of plastic was electronically, wirelessly, somehow hooked up to something out there. It's incredible what technology does. But that big mass of people that you saw at the start of the starting line, there is an actual starting line. There's a mat that you run across. Now, when I started, I was way, way back in the group, and when they shot off the cannon to start running, it took me two to three minutes, somewhere between two and three minutes, for me to get from where I was to the actual starting line. And that's when the race started. Well, how in the world do they know when I started the race? Well, that little plastic gizmo on the back of my number recorded the exact time in which I crossed that mat and started. And then when I got to the finish line, there was another mat you ran over, and that little plastic gizmo recorded my time at the end. But I noticed something. About four or five places in between the start and the finish, I ran over another mat. Now, one could say, you know what, that's helpful because then you can see your different times as you were running. At, like at five miles, this is where you were at and the pace you were running and so forth. 
But there is another more important reason. Because sometimes in races such as this, there is a temptation to take another course in order to get to the prize sooner. Now trust me, after about five or six miles, I was all for it. If there's a way to get from A to B quicker than the way they have it drawn out on this map going everywhere, I'll go. But isn't it interesting? Paul says, in order to finish the race and to receive the prize that God offers, we must be willing to obey and run the course marked out for us. 1980, a lady by the name of Rosie Ruiz ran the Boston Marathon. This is after she finished the race. And she looks about as tired as I felt when I finished the race. Nobody was there to help me out as these kind officers are for her. And on that day of that Boston Marathon back in 1980, she was the winner of the Boston Marathon. And she looks like she should have been the winner. She looks like she gave it her all and is actually dead tired. But it was eight weeks after the marathon was over that they discovered something about Rosie, that she really shouldn't have been this tired. Because you see, somewhere in that big mob, and if you're in the Boston Marathon, what you saw in this marathon looks like just a small little gathering. Amongst that huge mob of thousands and thousands and thousands of people, Rosie slipped out of the crowd and made her way over to the subway and got on the subway train and went to a location just a few blocks from the finish line. And there she spent the next couple of hours until it would be about the right time to be finishing the marathon in first place. And out of the crowds that were lining up, she managed to get into a group of ladies who were running and only have ran, you know, just a short period. She wasn't tired at all. And she just went right out and got in front and gave it everything she had and crossed the finish line. She was the winner. She got the prize. Except eight days later, she lost the prize. If you read... 1 Corinthians 9, carefully. And we're not there now, and you can go look later. But the last verse of that chapter says, Paul says, I run in a way so that I will not be disqualified. God has called us to run the course marked out for us. It is a beautiful thing that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. It's a beautiful thing that he has ran the race before us and he has set the course. But it is only such when we are willing to do what? To follow him. And sometimes the course that Jesus has laid out in front of us is one that requires us to be obedient to his will. Sometimes it isn't the way we want to go. Sometimes it isn't the experience we want to experience. And yet it is the course that has been marked out in front of us. And Jesus says, to win the prize, you must run the race that has been marked out in front of you. Run with perseverance. There were more than a few people like this in the race where you run as long as you possibly can and you realize you can absolutely run no further. And then you get a look on your face that kind of looks like that maybe and your running pace slows to a walk. I really came to appreciate the perseverance of many of the people who were running that race. As you were running in that large group at the start, it was interesting to listen to the different conversations. There were ladies there that the most that they had ever ran in their lives were two or three miles. And they were doing this just because they wanted to do it, to experience it, and to say that they had done it. And along the way, 
they were giving it everything they had, but along the way, there came a point where they probably couldn't run anymore. But they didn't stop. This man didn't stop. He kept doing what? He persevered and he kept going. Maybe not as fast as everybody else, but he kept doing what? Kept going. And God says when we run the race, we must run it with what? Perseverance. The other amazing thing that I saw numerous, numerous times, some of them speeding right by me. And that's when I would have said, well, I'm 74. How do you expect me to keep up with you? But there were people that were older than I, that's how I will describe them, that were running the race. And some of them have been doing it for ages and ages. One of our dear church family members, and he's still church family even though he doesn't live here anymore. He's over in Walla Walla where Tara and Ben defected to too. We're still a little sore about it if you can't tell. But Jim Grinley, still running marathons. What was it, his 80th birthday this year? And he rode his bike 100 miles on his 80th birthday. Uh, Jim's like this guy here. And perhaps the perseverance isn't so much in the fact that this guy was tired and running the race and persevering. The fact of perseverance I see in this man is he has long since passed the time when he needed to do this type of thing. And yet he was still doing what? Still going. Any of you feel that way here today? Like in this wait for Jesus to come, it should have happened a long time ago. And yet we're still running the what? We're still running the race. And we must do what? Persevere until he comes. I know there are some here today who are persevering in running the race. I look back and I see the Fernas and the Nancys and the Charleses that are here. All the years that they have come faithfully. Every Sabbath. Every Sabbath they're here. They're persevering. And if you went and asked any of them today, If they thought Jesus would have come by now, I can guarantee you they thought Jesus would have come a long time ago. And it could have been pretty easy to what? To give up. Did you know that many in our world have given up on this race? Have given up on Jesus? It's a lot of our world that has. My heart is encouraged every Sabbath when I stand up and I look back and see those who are persevering. And I will tell you, my generation, and I look and see Cindy here as well, my generation and younger, which is getting to be more and more of you, by the way, we have something to learn in this generation. Because you know what? In this generation, it is easier to take a Sabbath off than it is to come to church some weeks it is easier sometimes in this race to take time off. And that doesn't mean, oh, Pastor Jim's saying everything's lost because we didn't. No, that's not what I'm saying. But persevering and pressing forward and onward takes what? Takes effort. Takes just a love for Jesus in your heart that wants nothing more than to be on the course that what? Jesus has laid before us. And I happen to be one who believes that this place on Sabbath is a place that is more than important to be. Jesus called us to this place on this day for a reason. There is power here. There is encouragement. There is strength to persevere in the race that is found in this place that you won't get any other place. Enough said. Philippians chapter 3 and verses 12 through 14 is the verse we want to look at for perseverance here. Philippians chapter 3 and verses 12 through 14.
page 1163, Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. Not that I have already obtained all of this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that which Jesus Christ took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but I do one thing, forgetting what is behind me and straining towards what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Isn't that awesome? Not worried about what's behind me. I'm doing one thing. Hebrews says it's called fixing your eyes on who? Fixing your eyes on Jesus, the author, the beginner and the finisher of the race in your life, of your faith. But it says, I forget what's behind me. I forget the week that I've had behind me and I fix my eyes on Jesus and I do what? I press on. I persevere because the prize that Jesus has before me is worth persevering for, isn't it? Now this particular lady was not in the Missoula Marathon. This happens to be the San Diego Marathon. Her name is Harriet Thompson. She is 92 years old. 92 years old. She is now the oldest woman to complete a marathon, and she actually holds the record for that time. She's like 17 days younger than the one that had it before, and her time is about two hours faster. Her husband died several years ago from cancer. She has beaten cancer two times. If you notice, she wears tight white leggings because she needs those to cover the sores on her legs from the chemo treatments. 92 years old, battling cancer, and she's running a marathon. Perseverance, pressing forward. But she doesn't just run it so she can say, look at me, I'm the oldest woman running. She's been doing it for 16 years now. And in those 16 years, she has raised over $100,000 that she brings in in sponsorships for her running these marathons. That 100% of it has been given to fight cancer. 92 years old. And that's all she has to do with her life is to run marathons so she can earn money for cancer treatment. Praise God for that attitude and that heart that would persevere. And you know what? In this Christian race that we are in, we sometimes focus on the prize that we're going to receive. And let me tell you, the moment that I get to be with Jesus for eternity is going to be a cool day. And Jesus puts it in the Bible over and over again as a prize that is there, and he encourages us to look forward to it, not because it's a bad or selfish thing. It is a good thing to want to be with Jesus for eternity. But you know, along the way, Jesus has called us to run the race for a purpose. Along the way, we have a chance to do some good in this world for somebody else besides just us. At the end of the day, wouldn't it be neat to be like a Harriet Thompson who just perseveres, not just in getting the prize, but perseveres because in the process of doing it, it is doing something good for somebody else. Won't it be cool at the finish line if somebody might come up to you and say, you know what? Your perseverance, the way you ran the race inspired me to be here today. this aspect of what we talked about earlier today, living the Christian life in a way that really shares Jesus Christ. I will tell you, we can talk all day long about having Jesus in our lives. But the evidence of having Jesus in our lives must be there at some point, amen? Because if Jesus is really here, it should show outside. And you can look at this picture of Harriet Thompson and you can just blow your mind away that a 92-year-old woman is out doing that still in her life. 
But you know the thing that blows away my mind more than anything else is what she has done for people along the way. I can guarantee you the God that can take five loaves and two fishes and feed some 5,000 plus people can take $100,000 and do some amazing things in this world today. And when we run with perseverance, not just for ourselves, but recognize running the race with Jesus means you're running it for others as well. Don't you think there's some things God can do in us along the way? I think there has to be. That brings us to where this verse starts in Hebrews. Because we are surrounded by what? Such a great cloud of witnesses. The one thing that if I remember anything about July 10th, 2016, will be the great cloud of witnesses that were along every one of the 13.1 miles. People I had no idea remotely of who they even were, were there to encourage and holding signs to encourage and strengthen everybody along the way. They didn't care if it was the person they had come to watch that was running by. They were cheering. They were giving high fives. They had their kids out there. And they were enthusiastic about it. And I figured, you know what, I'd be really enthusiastic if I was this guy instead of that lady too. (laughs) But you don't get a medal for doing that. People of all ages and some kind of a Viking creature that was handing out water or Gatorade along the way. But you know, out every half mile on the race, there were tables set up. And over the course of the race, hundreds of volunteers that would come right out to you on the course and hand you a cup of water or a cup of gummy bears, which I found to be the thing that did the best for me. I tried, tried some of their yellow-green super Gatorade stuff that they passed in. About a mile later, it was not so super. Um, but the, uh, the gummy bears did good things for me. So next time, I'm going to load up on the gummy bears. But yeah, the other cool thing was, is along the way, outside of those tables that had been organized and set up, there were just random people that had set up stuff in front of their house to give you water or to set up a sprinkler that you could run through and cool off. And here's one of my favorites. You can't see it very well, but in the first mile, this gentleman had dressed up in a tuxedo and brought a grand piano out on the lawn right next to the course and was playing some of the most beautiful music you will hear if you like classical music, that kind of stuff, playing away on his piano. Why would he do that? Nobody paid him to do that. He was just there to do what? To encourage, to help out along the way. A mile or so after that, there was a guy on the side of the road playing his violin. Nobody asked him to do it. And then down on 7th Street, just a little ways past our school there, our church school, a dog even came running right out to the edge of the course, barking his head off. And I happen to be one who's experienced dogs that run at you and bark and they're not in a good mood when they do it. I walked away from that Bible visit with only one leg of my pants still on. But this dog didn't come that way. He had a big doggy smile on his face. And if he could have, he would have followed me the rest of the way. But it was like I was just taking all of this in and it was like, God, even the dogs are coming and encouraging. And my mind said, you know what? If we're not doing it, Jesus said, even 
the rocks will cry out. Because you know, along the way, we all need what? Encouragement. We all need it. And I will tell you that what kept me going at times and made me feel like, you know what, this is worthwhile, is a total stranger on the side of the road that would look right into my eyes and tell me that I was doing a good job. The Bible tells us that. Hebrews chapter 10 and verses 24 and 25. Page 11, 90, 1, 90, somewhere in there. Hebrews chapter 10, 24 and 25. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up on meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see what? The day approaching. You think God thought his Sabbath day was a good day to come and encourage and strengthen one another? You know what? He said, when you see the day approaching, you should even do it what? You should be doing it more often. Not less, friends. But as we see us getting closer to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ coming, we are to be doing what more and more? Encouraging one another. Building one another up. And he points to his holy Sabbath day as being one of the greatest opportunities we have to do that with one another. Building one another up, encouraging one another. You know, the Bible tells us that the road that leads to heaven is a wide path or a narrow path. As I was running, I came to understand that the reason God calls it narrow is because in his plan, on the course that he has marked out, there are so many people on the sides of the road encouraging each other along that the road has become very narrow. As I read my Bible, it's not because it's a hard thing to get to heaven. It's not because it's a narrow way because God doesn't want many people on it. I have come to understand in the Bible that it means it's narrow because it's supposed to be so crowded with people encouraging one another that there's not hardly room for the runners. Does it feel good to be encouraged once in a while on the race? Do you ever need it? I will tell you encouragement doesn't come natural to any of us. The Bible says it is a gift from God. And I know for this heart and this life, I need to be one who prays for that gift. It is so easy sometimes, even when we think we are doing something that will be helpful and good, to not do it in an encouraging way. And we can do more harm than good. God is asking us to be encouragers. Look around you. This is our family. We all love one another. The words we speak to one another should always be building us and the kingdom of God up even when we have to have hard conversations, it should be done in a way that builds up and encourages. And we all learn that the hard way. God knows that I have. Part of this week has been long because Pastor Jim has to continue to learn lessons along the way. And one of the lessons I'm learning is I need to be somebody that's along the road cheering on and encouraging everybody, even when I feel they need to be encouraged in a way that will make things better, I need to do it in an encouraging way. 
And I pray to God for this heart and for our hearts that we will understand the value of what encouragement does to the heart as we're running this race. We all need it. We all come in here every Sabbath and regardless of the smile we put on our face or whatever, in our lives we can be broken and hurting. And just to have someone along the side of the road to say, good job. Finish the race. Keep going. Means a world of difference. And in the end, I believe it brings us to the finish of the race. That gentleman there was in the marathon, not the half marathon. I finished my half marathon in one hour and 55 plus minutes. About 20 minutes later, this guy came across the finish line. Now, if you're doing the math, I'll help you out here. Obviously, for 13.1 miles, we were running at the same pace. I was right there with him. But somehow, for the second 13 miles that he ran, he did it in 20 minutes. I don't know how. He did that. But it's pretty amazing, isn't it, that a guy can start 13 miles farther behind me in the race and finish 26.2 miles of running in just 20 minutes longer than it took me to do. If you do the math, by the way, that's four-plus minute miles for 26 miles. You go out and try to run a four-minute mile, that's pretty much running as fast as you can go not an all-out sprint, but pretty much as fast as you can go and doing it 26 miles. Pretty incredible. The reason I put his picture up here is, is when this man crossed the finish line, there was more applause for him than when I did. I'm not quite sure what the deal was. People seemed to appreciate his effort more than me. Uh, it might have been his orange tank top and I was wearing red. I, I don't know what the deal was. But anyway, uh, they went crazy. But kind of the the cool thing was, is that I ran this race with my daughter, Brianna, and she also finished just about 20 minutes behind me. And when she was coming across the finish line, the crowd was going crazy because she was coming across at the same time as this man was. The marathon lane was over here, and the half marathon lane was over here, and everybody was all excited when she was crossing the finish line as well. It wasn't just for him. Who cares if he ran 26 miles? My daughter had just finished the half marathon. That's why they were all cheering, for heaven's sake. But you know, there was a neat thing that happened at the finish line. Every single person that went by, they had a guy up in the booth. And that little plastic gizmo, by the way, that is on your thing, was telling him who was coming down the thing there because you cross several mats before you get to the finish line. And so for every runner, he was announcing to all of those who were there, literally a thousands of people there cheering people at the finish line, he would announce every single runner who came across the finish line. And you know what? It was pretty cool after running 13 miles and being pretty tired that over the loudspeaker system, I heard this man saying, and here comes from Bozeman, Montana, Jim Jenkins. I had finished the race. And you know what? You might be tempted to think with this man who had just run 26 miles and was winning the men's marathon that all of the attention and stuff was on him that you know what? Somebody like my daughter who had ran 13 and wasn't winning the women's half marathon might just kind of get lost in the shuffle. But you know what? Her name got called out as well. From Bozeman, Montana, Brianna Jenkins. Amidst the big famous guy, somebody else was still important. And you know, at the end of the day, I think that's just how it's going to be when we cross the finish line. I believe Jesus is going to call each of us by name. 
you know what, if Pastor Jim happens to be crossing the line at the same time as, oh, let's say, Abraham, I don't think God is going to be so enthralled in Abraham that he forgets who I am. One last verse in our Bibles here. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 17. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 17. Page 1216, Revelation, last book in the Bible here. Revelation 2 and verse 17. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give him a white stone with a what? A new name. And I envision when I cross the finish line that I am going to hear my name. A new name. You know why it's going to be new? Because I'm going to be a new me. It's not going to be the old Jim that crosses the finish line. It's going to be the new Jim who has had the work finished in his life that the author and the finisher promised to do. And he is going to be 110% remade in the image of God. And I am longing to hear my name called out. And today, since we are surrounded by such a great crowd of witnesses, those who are cheering us on, encouraging us, not that the people in Hebrews 11, if we want to look at it that way, are still alive or doing whatever, but their examples, their faith, how they finish the race is an encouragement to all of us today. And we can be an encouragement to one another. And at the end of the day, because we are surrounded by this encouragement, because Jesus has ran the race before us and finished and he has laid out the course before us, he's saying, throw aside everything and run the course I've marked out. Run with perseverance. And fix your eyes upon Jesus, because in doing so, you will have run the race in such a way that you finish. That's my real prize, by the way. Both of us were still alive at the end of the race. And some 50 minutes later actually had enough muscle left to smile. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. In lieu of our time, we're going to close this way today. Do you want to finish the race? Do you want to be part of those who at His glorious appearing receive their prize? That's where your heart is today. I would invite you to stand with me as we close with prayer.